thank you. And what made the disciples all lose their lives for Jesus? What was the reason that Saul, who then became the Apostle Paul, would have a dramatic turnaround in his life? It was all because of the resurrection of Jesus. And, the, and Jesus' message in the Great Commission for us to go came from the resurrected Jesus. Now today as we're in the, the third chapter of the, um, of the book of Jonah, you know, if we just treat it as a history lesson, because even when Beck's been sharing the last two weeks, the many things that I didn't know that I've learned, but we can treat it as a history lesson and miss the very heart of God. Matter of fact, we can use this book as a history lesson and completely miss the very heart of God. And so I have to keep asking my question, do I have the same heart as the God and the Father I'm following? Do I hear him when he speaks to me about go? Because right from the very beginning of the Bible, God said go to Abraham, to Moses, to David, to Gideon, to Deborah, to Joshua, go. When we come to the book of Isaiah, there's this beautiful scene where it's like God says, who will go for us? You wouldn't, you wouldn't think, well, God could do it himself, but God goes, who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here I am, send me. Jeremiah, he goes, who am I? God says, go. Ezekiel, go. In the New Testament, to the disciples, go. Matter of fact, even before the disciples, at the, very, at the very resurrection of Jesus, to the women who were there, he gave the first message, you go tell the disciples. The first people that gave the message of Jesus' resurrection was the women at the tomb. Then did the disciples go to the church? Go. We've just been reading through uh, the book of Acts. And in chapter 9, it says that God talks to a man by the name of Ananias and says, God calls his name and Ananias' first response was, yes, Lord. And I look at that and I go, is that my first response? Is that our first response sometimes when we open the world, we feel God speak to us? Ananias just said, yes, Lord. And he says to Ananias, I want you to go to a, I'd like to see this street. I want you to go to a street named Straight. Obviously, the street was very straight. And he says, I want you to find Saul of Tarsus there, and I want you to go lay your hands on him. And Ananias goes, whoa, Lord, whoa, whoa. Do you know about this man, as if God doesn't, that he's going around throwing people in jail? As a matter of fact, as we talked the other week, the persecution of the church scattered the church. And at the stoning of Stephen, as the people are there stoning him, Saul of Tarsus is sitting alongside it. Now he's going everywhere with the religious leader's authority. Anyone who professed to be following Jesus, they would throw into jail, they would persecute them. Ananias goes, but Lord, do you know about this man? And God says to Ananias, just go and do what I say. And this beautiful verse 17 goes, so Ananias went. Ananias went. Ananias' obedience changed the course of history as to your obedience and my obedience. Influence the Bible read today challenges us. He changed the ministry to us Gentiles. Why did he go? It says he was just faithful. Maybe scared, maybe timid, may even have been anxious, but he was just a faithful disciple. We don't even hear of him again except twice later in the book of Acts, Paul will relate his testimony as to what's happened and what's changed his life. Twice he will refer to Ananias coming and laying his hands on him and praying over him. Is he still sending people? Is he still commanding you and I to go? But if I just read this book as a history lesson or to increase my learning, I have missed the whole message behind it. I have missed God's heart. I have missed God's faithfulness that we just sang about this morning. We've talked before that the book of Jonah is 8th century BC. God tells him to go and he goes in the opposite direction. 
You can run, but you cannot hide. David says, where can I go from your presence? If I go to the mountains, you're there. If I go to the valleys, if I go into the depths of fuel, you're there. Where can I go from your presence? He ran because he knew God would have mercy and compassion on them if they repented and turned to him. He goes, I knew you were God who was slow to get angry and full of unfailing love. Pastor Beck in her message last week said, God's grace to Jonah came in the form of a storm and of a fish. Jonah then goes, when I'd lost all hope, as low as I could get, I remembered God. And in chapter 2, he prays to God. He offers, I don't know how he did it, but he offers sacrifices to God and he worshipped. And so I'm trying to picture how did Jonah worship with his hands lifted high while he's in the belly of a great fish. I think Pastor Beck brought it out last week, the amount of times different words are used in the book of Jonah that are mentioned three times. I was reading this um, Instagram post by, his name is Professor Chad Bird. He's a, he's a pastor, he's a professor of exegetical theology of the Old Testament in Hebrew. So he sounds like he's got a lot of letters after his name, but what he said, it just backed up in what Pastor Beck was saying last week. He said, in the Hebrew, the word yared, Y-A-R-A-D, if that's how you say it, means to go down. It's mentioned three times. Jonah went down to Joppa. He went down to a ship. He went down into the hole to the sea, finally down into the bottom of the sea. He went down into the belly of a great fish and he faced death itself. Then he remembered Yahweh. Yeah. Professor Chad Bird says, listen, this is for some of you today, those watching online this morning. He says, when we have gone so far down in our own human condition, the only option left is to look up. And when we do, there is the Lord looking us in the eye with his grace and mercy, for he is a God who meets us at the bottom. If you only ever think that when I come to church, I raise my hands there, I meet God, you've missed it. Because he's a God who meets you at the bottom. And he's a God who meets you at your dead ends that we face. Matter of fact, he's a God who gets and is waiting at our dead end before we get there. For he is a God who meets us at the bottom. Says then the Lord ordered the fish to spit up Jonah on the beach, and it did. I think Pastor Beck said last week, I wrote it down, because this is for all of us, that we can, we can all be like Jonah. That Jonah wanted God to have mercy on him, be gracious to him, but not to others. And you can fill in the blank there, especially to the Ninevites. You know, in Luke 6, we're going to get to Jonah in a minute, but Luke 6, Jesus speaking, he said, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. And you know, when I I stand before him, I give an account of, how will I answer that question? Did you do good to those who hated you? No, not really, I didn't. Jesus said, do for others as you would like them to do for you. Jonah never heard Jesus' words, but we have. And Jesus modeled them before us. Be gracious to me, Lord, but not. And then Jesus said in verse 35, 36, love your enemies, do good and land, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons, daughters, of the Most High God, for he is kind. The word is actually easy to the unthankful and the evil. What? Why would God be easy to the unthankful and the evil? And he goes, therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Me giving mercy, grace, and compassion You know what the measuring stick is? My father. 
So I can't stand before him and go, well, what about this? No, no, no. The measuring stick as I follow Jesus. He's my father. And Jesus said, therefore be merciful just as your father also is merciful. And because we've received mercy and grace, we are to give it away. That was not in Jonah's thinking. And I could nearly say it's not always in mine either. Because we're about to see that Jonah's going to go back for a second time. Nothing's changed. They're still wicked. They're still evil. The the idea of God sending a prophet to them would be, go get them, destroy them, wipe them out. Listen to what, this is the second time, Jonah 3. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message of judgment I have given you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large it took three days to see it all. God went to Jonah the second time. You know why? Because he's the God of the second chance. Pastor Beck mentioned it last week. Matter of fact, I can look at my life and he's the God of the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh chance. If we were God, we would have cut it off at the first. He's the God of the second chance. If you're here today, you're watching online. Whether you're far from God or you're blinded, he's the God of the second chance. He's your father. But we have an enemy that lies to us and tries to convince us that God is dumb with you. Like the preacher, the prodigal son. And that you are no use. He will also lie and put in your mind, give up, get out. Why would you still even come? It's interesting, Pastor Beck said last week, instead of going 500 miles to Nineveh, he went the opposite direction, 2,500 miles to Tarshish. Now he's in Tarshish, he's 2,500 miles away. He's not even 500 And God appears to him a second time and says, go. Why didn't the fish just drop him back at Nineveh? Why didn't God just pick him up and drop him back? He's now two and a half thousand miles away from where he's supposed to be. When he was only 500 in the first place. I wonder what went through Jonah's mind. It's too far it's too long. It's too hard. But this, this, this time he went. What was going through his mind the whole way? Because some of the commentaries say that if he, if he went on horseback, even if, if he wasn't walking, even if he went on horseback, horseback it would have, could have taken him months. But we read it, it's the next verse. It's like all of a sudden he's there. It could have taken months. If we're driving in a car, that's pretty easy. But walking, horseback, months. And what would have been going through his mind the whole time? Why? But it's too far. It's too long. It's too hard. Send somebody else. Do I really have to? And he finally gets to the city that says it's large enough it takes three days to even get around. Next screen, thanks, Pat. God measures our faithfulness not according to what others are doing but according to our obedience to do what he has asked us to do. When I stand before him and give an account, I'm not going to give an account on behalf of Jonah. I'm going to give an account on the daily times I open up his word and I read and he spoke to me. What did I do with what he said to me? My faithfulness will not be measured how many times I came to church. I think I've told you before, I got a Bible. Well, I used to have a Bible at home. I, I can't find it now. It was given to me in 1960 by Brother Lane, who lived to be in his 90s. Perfect Sunday school attendance. Well, why not? My father was a pastor, didn't have any choice. <laughs> We're not going to be measured on our faithfulness about how many times we come together, although that is important. We'll be measured according what has he asked you to do? What has he asked me to do? Why didn't God use another prophet? 
One who would have done what he'd asked in the first place. Why not Micah or Obadiah? What about Joel? Why would God ask Jonah in the first place knowing that Jonah was going to go in the opposite direction? I've pondered these next two statements, these next two statements all week. I wonder if God was more interested in changing Jonah, changing his character, changing his heart, saving his soul more than just the Ninevites. And then the storms, trials, situations, testings in my life, are they there more to change me than me asking him to change my circumstance? Why would God send Jonah? He already knows he's got to refuse him. But God's heart was not just to change the Ninevites. He wanted to change Jonah. He was a prophet. He was supposed to be representing God. But there was something way out of whack in his thinking, in his heart, and in his soul. Changing circumstances is easy for God. Storms, fish, manna, water, impost, easy but to change me. You know what he does? He shows me his grace and love. And then he gives me the opportunity to receive it and to allow it to change me so that I would know that he is a God of grace. That's the whole book of Jonah. Jonah failed. Well, I think we just sang it in one of our songs. Jonah failed to see the depth of God's grace. I titled this message, well, I know we're talking about Jonah, but I actually titled it God's Faithfulness. Our sins, our failures, our guilt are no match for his grace and mercy and faithfulness. This small book of Jonah is a picture of God's faithfulness, not just to the Ninevites, but to Jonah and his faithfulness to us. You know what, church? Listen. If we fail to recognize and acknowledge his faithfulness each day, knowing we've done nothing to deserve it, We can actually cross a line into believing that we know it all, we have it all together in our strength and ability, and we're able to interpret all this in our own strength and our own ability. And we cross a line into this is how great I am and this is how much I know when we forget we're only here because of his faithfulness. Have you ever stopped and looked back And seeing God's faithfulness and grace to you when you never deserved it and you can't, you just shake your head because you don't know why he did that for you. I don't understand why you rescued me and kept me from my own foolishness. See, what we have here in the book of Jonah is a massive turnaround. This is not good people turning to God. This is evil, bad, sadistic men and women turning to God. A whole city. Not from Jonah's well-crafted, marvelous message. No, no, they believe God's message to them to repent and turn around. They heard God's heart. He could have wiped them out in an instant. He gave them 40 days to change and repent and turn to him. That was his heart. It wasn't Jonas. I was, I was reading a, an Instagram post yesterday from Graham, from Graham Cook. He's um, from the Bethel Church. He moves in their prophetic side. He says, prophecy is not just being able to tell the future. It's about revealing and unveiling the heart of God. 
You can stand up there and predict boom, 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 boom. And not unveil or not reveal the heart of God. That's what he's trying to show to Jonah. I'm going to give them 40 days to repent because that's my heart. Jonah's was, I'm going to come and give you the message and if you don't hear, God will wipe you all out. God said, no, no, I'm going to give you 40 days. They don't even need 40. Prophecy is not just being able to tell the future. It's about revealing and unveiling the heart of God. In the book of Ezekiel, there's a couple of interesting verses. In, in, he says in chapter 18, he says, if wicked people turn away from all their sins and begin to obey my laws and do what is right, God says, then they will surely live. They will not die. Then he goes on in verse 23. You got it there, Beck? Do you think, asks the sovereign Lord, that I like to see wicked people die? Of course not. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. This is the heart of God in the book of Ezekiel. We haven't even got to the cross of the New Testament. God says, I don't want to see people, wicked people die, people aren't following me. I just want to see them turn from their wicked ways and live. Peter picks it up. In the New Testament, in chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord isn't really slow about his promise to return because they're making accusations like, where's God? He must be slack. Why hasn't he already returned? And Peter goes, the Lord isn't slow about his promise to return. As some people think, no, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to perish. So he is giving more time for everybody to Repent. Look what happens. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne, took off his royal robes, he dressed himself in sackcloth and sat on a heap of ashes. That was like a picture in the Old Testament of repentance. Thank goodness we haven't got to do that today. Everyone must, the king goes, everyone must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence for who can tell, perhaps even, this is from an evil, wicked king, perhaps even yet God will have pity on us and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When they're confronted with God's message to turn, the entire city from the most important person to the bottom person repented. The sign of repentance was a change, was a godly sorrow as God speaks to you. It was a spiritual U-turn. There was an active response. There had to be an action that went with their turning of their heart. They believed God, not from just some mental belief. There was an activity that went with it. They've turned from being sadistic, evil, murdering. You, You name the list, they've turned to God with an action where they repented before him. They turned from their wickedness and turned. Then they proclaimed a fast, not just for the people, but for all our animals, for all the animal lovers that are here this morning. No food or drink. Everybody fasted. And then the king urges everybody. Could you imagine the noise that would have been coming from this city? The king urges everybody to call out earnestly to God and to turn from evil. Their actions were a visible evidence and demonstration of a heart change. The next verse, when God saw that they had put a stop to their evil ways, he had mercy on them. and didn't carry out the destruction he had threatened. In Dr. Tony Evans' commentary, he makes a comment, when repentance happens, you have a revival. It's a response from us for God to move. And then God's mercy 
and faithfulness triumphed over his judgment. Faithful, merciful, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, showers with grace, his grace, love and mercy have no limits. I'm not too sure how Jonah felt. Because, well, we, I'm not going to get into the next chapter, but Jonah very reluctantly finally delivers God's message and it results in one of the gr greatest revivals anywhere. The whole city turns. You know that you and I, we are all on mission. I'm not going to say ministers because then you look at, look at us and so if we say we're all ministers, although we are all ministers, you can exclude yourself because you don't have a title. We are all on mission. We are all on assignment. We're on his mission, his assignment. And as radical as Jesus' mission was, so is ours. And the same spirit that is on Jesus is on us and lives and dwells in us. The spirit of the Lord Jesus said is on me to bring the good news of the gospel of Jesus. Right. To open prison doors. To set free those in captivity. To heal the brokenhearted. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. You don't even need a call or someone to prophesy over you. You have a commandment. In 1 Samuel 17, you, you would have already heard me say it before, David's father sends him to go deliver cheese to his brothers. They're fighting the Philistines. Well, really, no one was doing any fighting. One over here is full of fear and one's over here. And When he turns up, he hears Goliath constantly taunting them and they're taunting them and their God. He's defying God and that upsets David. So he offers to fight him. I think we all know the story whether you, whether you attend church or not. But <clears throat> his father didn't believe in him. His brothers didn't believe in him. His king didn't believe in him. And Goliath certainly didn't believe in him. Listen to what David says. You should, probably should have this verse underlined in your Bible. Daniel, uh, David's just about given up on arguing with everybody that he wasn't fit. He was only a kid. He was a nothing. 1 Samuel 17, 29, David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? I don't need a call. I have a commandment from Jesus himself. And because I'm on his mission, as I look around me, there's a lot of causes. His brother said to him, you're just an insolent blah, blankety blank, blank, blank. You've just come down to see what is happening. Why don't you go back to your little sheep? And David doesn't look at his brothers. He looks at Goliath. He looks at the enemy. He says, doesn't this matter what is happening is there not a cause the word is there is there not a thing is there not a word is there not an answer and when we stand here today and when we leave this building we go back to where we live when we look at our nation we look at the nations of the world and Jesus given us a commandment to go is there not a cause the worship team would come this morning. In his book, <clears throat> uh, The Prodigal Prophet, in case the worship team didn't hear me, in his book, The, uh, the Prodigal Prophet, Timothy Keller talks about cities, talks about God's love of people and God's great love for the cities in our world. And when I started to think of some of the cities, you know, there's some cities in our world that are, big, that are bigger than our nation. And he talked about the chaos and everything that's happening. And I don't want to take away anything from Ethan next week, but I encourage you when you go home, read chapter four before next week. 
And look at the very last verse. I'm not even going to give you the last verse. But God asked Jonah a question. It's the last thing he says to Jonah. I don't even know what happened to Jonah after that. And he wasn't even asking Jonah a question for Jonah to answer. He asked a question in a sense. His final question to, to Jonah was actually a statement. It's actually the statement of his heart for people and for cities. Go home and read it when you get home. Let me ask you a question this morning as we come to communion. You're joining us online this morning. We're going to do communion this morning. We're going to sing about God's faithfulness. Let's stand this morning. Can I ask you a question? Are you running from God? Or is there some area of your life that you are running from God where you've blown it or where you've missed it? And maybe this morning you're at the bottom. But the good news, He's a God who meets us at the bottom, who meets us at our dead end. He's the God of the second chance. Well, listen to this. He's also the God of missed opportunities. Can you recall one missed opportunity to share Jesus with someone you now wish that you could get back? I do. Give it to him. And I'll, don't come under condemnation this morning. Just give it to him. It's a matter of saying, Lord, I missed it. Help me. Fathers, we stand here this morning. We thank you for your great faithfulness to us. Faithfulness, the psalmist says, is your very character. Thank you for your mercy, your grace, your compassion, your patience with us, your goodness. We hear, we obey, we go because of your great faithfulness to us. We're going to sing that hymn this morning, Great is Your Faithfulness. first verse says, his compassions fail not. Which means it's impossible for God not to be full of grace, full of mercy, full of compassion, full of forgiveness. That's who he is. The second verse says summer, winter, springtime, harvest means that through every season of our life, some of you are here in different seasons. Some of you are in great season. Some of you are here in barren season. Maybe you're in a season you don't even know what the next door is. But in every season of our life, He is faithful. Yeah. It's God's faithfulness. And then the second, the third verse says, pardon for sin and a peace that endures. Then He says, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Who needs strength just for today? Lift your hand where you are. Strength for today. Strength for today comes from the God who is faithful. And hope that we have in tomorrow is hope in Him because He is faithful. And as we worship and sing in this hymn this morning, I'm just going to welcome you and just any time during the hymn, just take the bread. I thank you. You're faithful. You are my healer. I thank you for healing over my household today. And as I take this cup, I thank you, Lord, that when I've missed it and blown it, you're the God of the second chance. You're the God who meets me at the bottom. You're the God who meets me at my dead end. You're the God who meets me when everything is falling around me. That's who you are because you are a faithful God. Maybe you're here this morning watching online. You don't know anything about God's faithfulness. Can I say to you, put your trust and faith and hope in Jesus this morning. Put your faith and trust in hope in Him. There's no other way to live. And online, there'll be people who will communicate with you. And when we finish our service this morning, we'll be down the front. If you're here today, 
And for the first time, you're saying yes to God's grace, yes to His faithfulness, yes to His love, yes to His mercy. And like the Ninevites, it means there's a spiritual U-turn that takes place. We go from the way we were going to turn and to follow Him this morning. Let's sing this this morning.